Hello, I'm George Snyder, a World War II veteran from the European Theater of Operations. Uh, I served as a scout and observer in the 30th Infantry Division, nicknamed the Old Hickory, and participated in the five major campaigns across Europe, beginning with the Normandy, followed by the Northern France, the Rhinelands, the Ardennes, which is the Battle of the Bulge, and then Central Europe. Now, uh, in the previous program, I covered the Normandy campaign, and uh, that covered from D-Day landing in June the 6th, 1944, until July the 25th, when we finally broke out from the hedgerow countries in uh, St. Lo, France, during Operation Cobra and it was our division that led the breakout. Now, from that point on, the campaign changed from the Normandy campaign to the Northern France campaign. And this is a campaign we'll be talking about today. Uh, in a way, it's somewhat of a misnomer because even though it's called the Normandy campaign, or the Northern France campaign, there was still some bitter fighting that took place in Normandy notably the Battle of Mortain, which I covered in the first program, and the British experienced a severe tank battle in the vicinity of the Falaise Gap. But regardless of that, that's all called the Northern France, and in the end, we were actually in Belgium instead of France. After uh, Mortain, we start moving across France quite rapidly, and there really isn't any particular battle that stands out in Northern France campaign. These were all small skirmishes, uh, little individual battles, and uh, they occurred when we liberated the towns in the city. We liberated some good-sized cities and towns. And uh, I think an example of the type of uh, firefights and the uh, skirmishes that we had would be an example that I experienced. We were moving through uh, France in a little village called Misery. And uh, it's a small village that had uh, fewer than 300 people. And by day's account, I think they're down to about 199. It's a very small village. And I speak French, and as a scout, I would contact the resistance forces and any civilians that might be able to provide information about the enemy. So we we're coming through Misery and uh, the crowd, the small crowd from town was all lined up to greet us, and an old lady came up to me, and she said that there were three Germans up a little trail here that would probably surrender without any problem. And uh, she said that they had asked her for some milk that morning, so they, they were not dangerous particularly. So about then, uh, the rest of the column was coming through town, and I spotted uh, uh, one of my friends, uh, Mike Jacobs, he was uh, an ammunition carrier, so all he had was a 45 sidearm. And I told, asked him if he'd want to come along and get these three prisoners. He said, how many are there? I said, there's supposed to be three. He said, well, well let's make it even. So he stopped uh, Sergeant Vargas, who was armed with a carbine, and uh, the three of us uh, began our little trek up this trail, and by then about four or five French people had joined us. One in particular was a good-looking blonde girl who had two pails full of cider that she was going to empty into our canteens. So we were watching her probably more than we should have been paying attention to the prisoners. So as we approached them, we saw them in the middle of the street, and I leveled my M1 at them, and uh, uh, they threw their hands up and motioned them to come toward us which they did, and we gave them a quick search, turned them around, and started back into town. This was only about 150 feet from the town square there. And we heard this uh, vehicle approach from behind us. And we hadn't paid much attention, but there was a, a stone wall about eight feet tall on the right, and it had merged, emerged out from behind this wall. It was a big black, open top command car, had three SS troops in it. These were the dreaded 
worst uh, of the Germans, the SS, and all Nazis. And there was a driver, uh, someone in the front seat, and a, an officer in the back seat. And before we could do anything, the, the man in the front seat stood up, and I was looking down his rifle, or his automatic weapon. He had an automatic weapon. I was looking right down his barrel. I saw three puffs of smoke come out, and the Frenchman standing next to me was hit in the shoulder, and he missed me. And I, of course, returned fire with my M1 that I, I had to fire from the hip. It was so sudden. And when I fired, he dropped. The driver put the car in reverse, and they backed up behind the wall. And by then, my comrades going through town heard the shooting, and they came rushing to help us out. Uh, we scaled the wall and looking for them, and they had taken off into the woods and disappeared. And uh, a few minutes later, we heard a machine gun open up, and all three were found dead. So that, that's a, a typical of the type of skirmishes that we had in these little villages. Uh, I remember going into some with uh, tracers flying all over and uh, some, some mortar fire, but nothing really very heavy at any time. Now, there was another, another incident. Uh, could have been dangerous, but it was more uh, almost amusing. We had reached our objective for the day, and it happened to be an open oat field, I believe, and it was starting to rain late in the afternoon. It was going to be a miserable night out in an open field. So Captain Pritchard, he was our S-2, or intelligence officer. He was in charge of the intelligence section that I was in. He said, you know, it's not going to be very comfortable out here in the rain all night. He said, see if you can find some accommodations for us, some kind of a a house, a shack, a chicken coop, anything to get us out of the elements. So there was, wasn't was anything within sight. So there was a Frenchman there, and I start talking to him, and he said, yeah, he could provide something for us. I said, well, where is it? He says, down this little trail here. I said, how far? He said, not far, just a few meters. So I told Captain Pritchard, he said, well, let's go check it out. So the three of us and the, his Jeep driver, we drove down this trail, and within a very short distance, it got so overgrown with shrubbery, we couldn't travel with the vehicle anymore. So we dismounted, and the Frenchman, Captain Pritchard, and I walked uh, into the little village. And this opened up into a cobblestone street, which dead-ended at this trail, and there wasn't a sound. It couldn't hear a dog bark. There was nothing. And uh, there were only about two houses on the right side before we got to a main road coming through town. And a shutter opened up on the top floor, and some old lady peeked out, and she was shocked to see us, I'm sure. She quickly closed her shutter, and then the uh, Frenchman pointed across the street to his home. And he said, this is it, my home. You can have it. So, gee, that's great. Nice brick house. and. Uh, so we checked it out, and we said, boy, we'll, we'll even have a place to sleep in a bed tonight. And about then, the church bell started to ring. And in Europe, whenever a town was liberated, the first thing they did was to ring the church bell. So everybody knew they'd been liberated. So I looked at him, and I said, why, why are you ringing the church bells? Why, you've liberated us. I said, you mean this hasn't been taken yet? No, it's been in German hands. He said, but don't worry, they're up the road here a ways, and they're fleeing. They're coming through town, but they don't have any heavy armor, no tanks, just light armor and infantry. So Captain Pritchard said, let's get out of here. So we r ran across the street, looked up the street. There weren't any Germans coming. And uh, we left the Frenchman standing there trying to figure out why we wouldn't accept his hospitality, I guess. So that could have been a dangerous situation, but turned out uh, more amusing than anything, I guess. From there, we moved on, more liberations of uh, French towns. And on September the 1st, we were just north of Paris, which is probably a little bit further north from where De Gaulle Airport is right now. And uh, Captain Pritchard came to me it was late in the afternoon of uh, September the 1st. He says, come on, Schneider, we're going to Belgium. 
I said, Belgium, that's over 100 miles from here. He said, yeah, it's over 100, but we're going there. The plan called for three divisions to move simultaneously in th on three main roads going north. Our division, the 30th, was to be in the middle. The second armored would be on our right flank and the 28th division on the left flank. Each division was headed by a sizable task force. We had no heavy tanks, but we did have some armored vehicles and infantry. Now, our battalion was not selected to be in this task force, but Captain Pritchard was not about to be denied this wonderful opportunity. He was always looking for something like that. So uh, we uh, decided to join this task force. Uh, he took the command of his own jeep, and then he got uh, Captain Ed Hill, who was our S3, or operations officer, to join us. And the three of us joined this task force. And by, by nightfall, we'd gone quite a ways. We were almost a third of the way into Belgium. And it wasn't until the next day on September the 2nd, the forward elements of the task force crossed into Belgium at the city of Mold. Uh, at 6.30 in the afternoon, and that made us the first American division into Belgium. Now, uh, the three of us followed about two hours later in, in total darkness, and once we crossed the border, we were on our own. We had no idea where we were. All we knew was that we wanted to get on our objective, which was the Brussels Tournay Highway, which was about 13 kilometers to the north. We had first to go to a city of Antoine, which was only 10 kilometers to the north. So we got to Antoine, no problem, and uh, I tried to get some directions on the, the next three, three and a half kilometers, and I couldn't get any help. So we thought we would just uh, pick a road and head north. And it was slightly dra uh, raining right now, cloud covered, but it was almost either a full moon or almost a full moon. And the moon would pop out from behind the clouds and it gave us enough light so that we could get our bearings. So we started moving along this canal heading north. And all at once we heard a vehicle approaching us. So we stopped the Jeep. Uh, Captain Hill pulled back the bolt on a 30 caliber machine gun we had mounted in the front. He was ready to start firing. I jumped off to the side and I challenged them, and, and they answered me in, in French. So I knew they were Belgian. I was just able to stop Captain Hill from starting firing at them. Uh, they wondered what we were doing there. What are three Americans doing wandering in the Belgium in total darkness, not knowing where we were going? So they, uh, they said that you're on the wrong road. Uh, right up the road is a, a contingency of Germans. You're going to run right into them. And they said that they had run into them, and they had a casualty in the back of this old truck. So they took me to the back of the truck. They had a flashlight, and they showed me this casualty in the back. They said they wanted to take him back into Ontoid and get some uh, medical assistance. So they said, you got to turn around, go back, and uh, cross the drawbridge. Now, this is not a large drawbridge. It was... Uh, probably no more than 60, 70, 75 feet across. He said, you've got to cross the drawbridge, get on the other side. So we did this. We went back down, and we saw the drawbridge. We approached it, and we were challenged by the, the L'Armée Blanche, which is a resistance force. And I identified ourselves, and, oh, les Américains! There was a rattling of chains, and the drawbridge came down. We crossed the drawbridge. And on the other side, there was a Belgian eating a salami sandwich. Uh, everyone says, how do you know he was e eating a salami sandwich? Well, 10, 11 o'clock at night on a rainy night, you can smell a salami sandwich. So we asked, asked him how we could get on the road to our objective. He said he could do that, so he sat on the front fender of the Jeep and directed us a block or so to a traffic circle and put us on the right road heading north. And uh, so we take off on this road, and it's about three, three and a half kilometers to our objective. And we got within probably no more than 50 yards from our objective, and there was a bend in the road, 
at about 2 o'clock, and it cut through a hill, so there was a mound on each side of the road. And before we could go any further, a firefight broke out right in front of us at the intersection. Tracers were flying overhead and on both sides of this mound. We abandoned the Jeep and ran to the, this mound on the right for cover. And uh, all at once there was a couple of explosions and the whole sky lit up. And uh, what had happened was we had caught up with our recon troop. And they ran right into a German rear guard action that was sitting right on our objective. And uh, after the, the two Jeeps and a scout car were destroyed, everything got quiet except for the crackling of small arms that were burning in the fire. And uh, so we waited until that was over and then made it back to the Jeep. It had been protected somewhat because of the bend in the road. It had a couple of bullet holes in it, but other than that, it was drivable. So we physically turned it around without starting the engine and headed back into Antoine. And the first person we run into is our Swami Eaton friend. And he insisted that we use his home for our headquarters. So he took us to his home, which happened to be a tavern. And across the street was the railroad station of Antoine. And by now, our battalion had caught up with us, and it was around midnight, I guess, and we housed the whole battalion in that uh, train station for the night. The next morning, the Germans had fled, and we were able to get on our objective. Now, as we drove into the town where, uh, where the Germans had been, a town called Gorin, uh, the civilians had placed three of the troopers who had been killed, they placed them uh, alongside the road and they had them covered with flowers. So they, uh, they offered the town hall for our battalion headquarters. So we accepted this and uh, settled down in the town hall. And uh, right away, there was a Belgian nurse who was looking for some supplies to treat some of their wounded. And uh, I was the only one who could speak to her, so they directed her to me. It happened to be, uh, it was uh, uh, Odette. Odette Fontaine was her name. And uh, so I took her to the medics, and uh, they gave her a bunch of aspirin, and some iodine, and mercurochrome, and a bunch of bandages. And then a little later, she came looking for me with a bottle of wine. So that's how I got to meet Odette Fontaine, but it was a very short relationship because we were in there two days and she kept coming to see me, but she started bringing Leo, her boyfriend, along. So that was the end of our relationship. Uh, now, while we were there, the British passed through us for about two days. And then uh, we decided to move on further. There was one more objective that was to be taken in the northern uh, uh, France campaign. And some 60 years later, a Belgian military historian, a Colonel Bowders, or Bote, I think they called him, uh, wrote his version of that first night in Belgium. It's quite detailed, and he had a lot that I didn't know about. And he heard, I had written an article entitled First in Belgium, so he uh, checked on my version, and he uh, agreed that it was authentic, and he included it in his book. And in his research, he was able to find that body, that was, uh, the person that we had seen in the back of that truck. Turned out it was, his name was Lucien de, de Large, and uh, he had Lucien write to me, and he thanked me for not having shot him up that night. But it's amazing the research these guys do. And in his research, he was able to find uh, Odette, Odette Fontaine. She had married Leo and now had a family. Now, uh, this pretty much culminated most of the fighting in northern France, but there was one more major objective, and that was Fort Ibn Mall, which was the largest inland fort 
in Europe. It was in Belgium on the Belgian-Netherlands border. And uh, uh, it was built as a self-contained unit. They had a hospital in there. They had living quarters. They even had a machine shop to repair their weapons. And it was on the Albert Canal, and the, all, almost all of the, uh, the weapons faced east because a potential enemy when it was built was Germany. So we came from the west, and there was almost no armament facing us. In the meantime, the uh, 500 Germans that occupied the fort, they abandoned the fort. We didn't even know it. They abandoned the fort, and they were, they were reassigned to either guard or blow up some bridges that were on the Albert Canal and the, the Moss River, which parallels the canal. So uh, they didn't know we were there, and they apparently came marching in formation, which you never do in combat. So that's how little they knew about our position, apparently. And our heavy weapons company, M Company, opened up on them with machine gun fire and mortars. And they were so close that the mortars were firing almost straight up in the air. And as a result of this, the, the Germans suffered heavy casualties. Now, uh, uh, after this, uh, there wasn't too much to do, except uh, we had a couple of interesting, happy occasions that occurred during the Northern France campaign. And this was the liberation of Paris. Paris was liberated on the 25th of uh, August, and uh, the, the uh, resistance forces began fighting on the 19th in Paris, and by the 25th, the uh, Germans that had the largest garrison, they gave up, and Paris was liberated. And uh, I had wished I'd been there. This was the probably, probably rivaled the celebrations that took place on May the 8th when uh, D-Day was declared. Now, there's one, one other unpleasant occurrence, and uh, I can just barely mention this, but another, an officer and I investigated a crowd in a French town, found out they were uh, trying some French women for having slept with the Germans, and the uh, penalty was to cut their hair off, disrobe them almost completely, and then paint a swastika on them and run them out of town. When they found out I spoke French, they tried to escort me to the front and wanted me to cut the hair off of uh, the next victim. Now, uh, I wasn't about to do this. Uh, I said, I'm not about to throw the first stone. I said, you don't know anything about these. Uh, perhaps sleeping with a, a German, maybe uh, she got a loaf of bread or a, a bottle of milk for a, a baby that was malfed or starving, I don't know. So, so I wasn't about to, uh, to uh, cut any hair or, or humiliate one, one of these women. But that was not a pleasant experience. Uh, the, the crowd was very unruly. Actually, the square was built like a Western American town. The town hall faced the, the square, and there was a... Uh, ramp of steps on each side going up to the balcony, which is where the supposed trial was taking place. And the one in charge was calling for, uh, for attention, and everyone was shouting, and so he finally pulled out a revolver, shot into the air, and uh, the crowd cried it down. And he asked if anybody in the crowd could verify that she had slept with anybody. So they were trying to confirm it that uh, she wasn't that nice a lady. So uh, that was an unpleasant affair, and uh, I'd rather end it with the pleasant affair of, uh, of uh, liberation of Paris, and I wish I had been there, but I didn't make it. So uh, our next program, we're going to cover the Rhinelands, and I hope you'll be watching for that, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this program. Uh, We'll see you at the next time.
until then, I salute you.